Take your copy of God's Word, open it up, uh, our third week in the book of Amos. Uh, I believe, New Hope, that uh, we are at a tipping point of culture, a tipping point in the nation, uh, and Amos, uh, the book of Amos in the Old Testament, has a profound word of insight written 2,700 plus years ago, but the words that he speaks and proclaims to Israel, I'm telling you, could be copied and pasted and put upon our culture. It's an essential word for what we need to hear in our time today. We'll get to that passage in a moment, beginning in chapter three. But first, a look from a book uh, I read this year called a letter to the American church. It's written by Eric Metaxas. Uh, Eric writes a book as he looks at the scope of the nation, the condition that we're in, and he looks at the trajectory we are on down the road with great concern, and he writes the book as a warning, a, a flag of caution, a sounding of an alarm, specifically to the American church, that is to people who profess faith in Christ, to say, guys, it's time that you better wake up. It's in that book that he uh, goes back in history, and he relates uh, our time to the time of the rise of the Nazi regime. Uh, that is in the 30s and the 40s, leading up to what we now know as the atrocities of the Holocaust. But he doesn't go back to examine the atrocities. He rewinds the clock five years before the atrocities to examine the question, what role, if any, did the church play in sounding the alarm? What role did specifically pastors in Germany play in calling the people of Germany to, to wake up and pay attention to the warning signs? It's in that time that he says that there was about 18,000, get it, 18,000 Protestant pastors in Germany in the lead up to the Holocaust. Of those 18,000, here is the breakdown of how they responded. He said 3,000 of them actually sided with Hitler, aligning themselves with the Nazi regime. They conformed to the culture. There was 12,000 Protestant pastors who remained neutral. That is, they were complacent. They chose not to speak out. They chose not to engage. They chose not to be political. Rather, they allowed the shepherding voice to go unheard as the regime ramped up towards the atrocities of the Holocaust. And only 3,000 of the 18,000 pastors actually had the courage and the conviction to prepare the congregations and to wave the caution flags to say, guys, you better wake up to what's coming on the horizon. Now, I want you to contemplate this because out of 18,000 pastors, or you could say out of 18,000 churches, there was 15,000 of them who were not hearing a solid proclamation and warning to the church. Only 3,000 of the 18,000 were waving the caution flag to say, guys, you better pay attention to what's coming up. Now, New Hope, I don't know about you, but this calls to mind to me two questions. First of all, uh, as I read the book and as I think about these statistics, I think first, uh, is in fact our nation headed for trouble? And you can come up with your own uh, answer to that, but I believe that we are resoundly headed for trouble as a nation. The second question, what role, if any, should I play? What role, if any, should New Hope play in sounding the alarm? And my friend, I wanna be part of those who with courage and conviction at least sound the alarm to say, guys, we're headed for trouble, but we have hope in a risen savior. So that's, that, that's the rub. This is where Amos comes in. Because either we're gonna be conformed to the culture, or we're going to be complacent in the midst of the culture, or we're going to have courage to speak up and to proclaim God's word. This is Amos's role. And now the third week, we are opening the book of Amos. Amos, his name means to carry a heavy load. New hope, it is a heavy load. Uh, when you are entering into the culture to speak and to proclaim and have the courage to speak up, it is a very heavy load. His name also means to be carried by God. And aren't we thankful that though we carry a heavy load, we are also carried by the strength of the Holy Spirit? Here is Amos being carried by God. And in chapter 1, verse 2, he said, the lion has roared from Zion. Amos enters into the culture, and, and he begins in chapter 1 and chapter 2. Here it is. Chapter 1 and chapter 2, he, he begins by uh, proclaiming a dreadful reality. Last week's message, the dreadful reality is this, is that as nations, specifically Judah and Israel, God's people, 
but more broad, as nations persist in sin, when nations persist in sin, the patience of God eventually wears out. And in chapter one and two, the Lord is very clear with the nations that he will not leave their sins go unpunished. There comes a point when enough is enough, even with God. Or as I said last week from the great theologian Popeye, I've had all I can stands. I can't stands no more. And so in chapter one and two, the Lord engages through Amos to say, I've had enough's enough. And now we move on from this, from the dreadful reality to what I'm gonna call a dire warning. Chapter three begins a series of proclamations in which now we get to hear, what is the lion roaring? Chapter one, two, the lion roars. Well, what does he say? Because it is the Lord who is speaking, the king of the universe who's proclaiming something. What does the lion roar? Well, take a look at your Bibles. Chapter three, verse one. Chapter four, verse one. Chapter five, verse one. You're gonna see the repetition. Hear this word. Hear this word. Say it. Hear this word. It's a series of three proclamations in which the Lord is laying a message on Amos to say, Amos, go into the culture and specifically now to Israel, to my people, and I want you to proclaim a series of three messages to wave the warning flag, to sound the alarm that they would wake up from their slumber. And here's those three messages, if I could summarize. Here it is. Uh, the wet messages are, chapter three is, wake up. Guys, wake up. Chapter four, prepare to meet God. In chapter five, seek the Lord and live. Wake up is this week. Prepare to meet God is next week. Seek the Lord and live is two weeks from now. It is a series of proclamations in which hear this word. Church, listen up. It is an urgency and with clarity thou that we hear the proclamation of Amos's voice ring out into the world. New Hope, uh, if, if we could, again, overlay our culture onto the book of Amos, I think it is profound that we would once again hear these messages. And my prayer for you this morning, my prayer, in fact, throughout the whole book of Amos, is that he who has ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. And I believe that resounding very clearly from the book of Amos, fast forwarding through history, is a proclamation that says, church, you better wake up. Church, you better prepare to meet God. Church, you better seek the Lord and live. And it is these three repetitions over and over that the lion is roaring from Zion. If I could summarize this sermon in one sentence, here it is. Sermon in a sentence, wake up and realize the nation is headed for trouble, but there is hope. Wake up and realize. The this is what Amos is saying in chapter three. He's saying, People of God, wake up because you are headed for trouble and we're going to intertwine within that, but there is hope. Because here at New Hope, we are under the banner of a savior who has defeated death, reversed decay, and rose triumphantly. And so though we may uh, echo a verse of warning, though we, may, uh, though we may proclaim a warning and sound the alarm for the culture in terms of where we're headed, may we never forget that we are not people without hope. Our hope is grounded in the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And so we intertwine a clear prophetic warning for where we're headed but we also know the end of the story. God's plan is unfolding in history. Nobody can stop him. And ultimately, the church will rise victorious and those who cling to Christ will be saved, though the remnant may be small. That's where we're headed. Here we go. Let's jump into the passage. Chapter uh, three, verses one through eight. Trouble is brewing. Trouble is brewing. Take a look with me. Hear this word that the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel, against the whole family that I brought up out of the land of Egypt. There's a repetition of a word. What is it? Against. Now here in New Hope, don't we celebrate the great New Testament truth uh, that if God is for us, who can be against us? Isn't it a glorious thing to have God for you? But how devastating it would be to have the God of the universe speak a word against you. 
And here is God speaking against his people. And notice this is not against the nations. He says, against you, O people of Israel, against you who I have ransomed out of Egypt. The Lord is calling a nation to task. Why? Because of their persistent sin. He's going to be echoing this fact that trouble is brewing in the nation. And why is it brewing? Here's the point. Sin has invited it. God is initiating it. And the pulpits or the prophets of the time are responsible to announce it. Take a look at verse 1 and 2, and you'll recognize that sin in the nation has invited it. In verse 2 specifically, the Lord says, I am against you, O Israel. Why? Because of your iniquities. Though you are my chosen people, I am about to discipline you for your consistent rebellion against the Lord. Now, New Hope, don't miss this. Because though the Lord will call the nations to account, that was last week, chapter one and two, he's gonna call all of these nations to account. Don't miss it. Here specifically, he is calling his own people to account. He loves his people. The Lord is coming against them, not, here it is, not as a vindictive landlord intending to evict, but as a gracious father looking to correct And the sin has gone on long enough that the Lord has said, enough is enough. Why is trouble brewing? Because sin has invited it upon themselves. And make no mistake, though the trouble will be experienced at every level, every sector of society, whether the economy and the politics and the personal lives and wealth and finance, though it will be felt across every level of society, let us not forget It is the Lord who will initiate the hand of discipline. The Lord himself. Amos wants the people to uh, understand this very clearly, that when the trouble begins to show evidence in the culture, he wants them to understand this is not just some, uh, some political thing or some economic thing. No, no, no. This is the hand of discipline coming from Almighty God against the nation as an active form of discipline because you have sinned against him. Take a look at verse 3, 4, and 5. Amos now begins to ask a series of questions. New Hope, I'm going to summarize it. He asks seven questions. Every one of them has an obvious answer, and his point with the first six is to show the natural cause and effect relationship between two things. He draws attention to human experience. Can two people walk along the road unless they agree to do so? No, they can't. Can a, does a lion roar in the thicket or in the forest unless he has prey? No, he doesn't. He asks a series of yes-no questions which are obvious to those who are listening. If I could simply illustrate, I would simply say this. Uh, Does a skunk spray without stinking? No. Okay. Does a baby cry without making a sound? No. Okay. So obvious connections, cause, effect, cause, effect. Amos' point is to draw attention to one thing, and it's the seventh question. Take a look with me at verse six. In verse six, here is the point, and it's a powerful verse that ought to be examined. He says, does disaster come to a city unless the Lord has done it? That's the point. The point of the first six questions is to kind of poetically build up the case for the seventh and final question to say, guys, you better wake up because active judgment is coming and know this, there is a cause-effect relationship between your sin as a nation and the divine judgment that's coming from the Lord. That is the key thought. Here it is. The key thought, national sin has a cause-and-effect relationship with divine judgment. Trouble is brewing in the nation. Why, church? Why? Sin has invited it. God is initiating it. And it is the purpose of the pulpit to declare it. It is the purpose of the prophet to announce it. And verse 7, we get to one of the most significant. New Hope, if you checked out, check in. Verse 7 is one of the most significant verses in the Bible that testifies to the character of God. Because God does not 
lash out unexpectedly against a people as if like, oh, I didn't see that coming. But God is gracious, abounding in steadfast love. He's patient. What does 2 Peter say last week? 2 Peter 3, uh, the Lord is not slow to keep his promises as some understand slowness, but the Lord is patient with you, not desiring that anyone should what? perish, but all should come to salvation in Christ. And so here we have in chapter three, verse seven, we, hate, we, we get a glimpse into the character of God. That before the judgment comes, God once again is faithful to testify to the world. Look at verse seven. For the Lord God does what? Nothing. Nothing without revealing his secret, or some translations, his plan to his servants, the prophets. Now understand this in the context of the passage. The passage is saying trouble is brewing, trouble is coming. The nation is, is moving towards divine judgment. Uh, there's a connection between national sin and divine judgment. So divine judgment is coming, but here's the hope. Verse seven. Verse seven is that that day of judgment will not come until the Lord has revealed his plan through his prophets. Question, New Hope, why does the Lord do that? The Lord reveals his plan, in this case to Amos, to warn the nation, why? Because of his longing for them. To give time after time of chance after chance to repent and what? To seek the Lord. Wake up, prepare to meet God, seek the Lord and live. New Hope, does that make sense? God does nothing without first revealing it through the prophets. And so Amos, there he is, one of those prophets who refused to conform to the culture, one of those prophets who refused to be complacent in the culture, but he is a prophet with courage and conviction to speak into the culture, to warn. Why? Because the Lord God has revealed his plan to his prophet and he's, he's forecasting it to the nation to say, guys, you better wake up. New Hope, that's the type of man I want to be. I don't want to bury my head in the sand and pretend everything's okay. I want to look ahead to say, guys, yeah, trouble is brewing. Our sin as a nation has invited it. The act of discipline of God is coming against it, but I want to be the type of guy in the type of pulpit that announces it to say there is hope in the risen Savior. And our attention and our focus needs to go to him, that no matter how dark times get, that we still can be faithful to Christ, and he, of course, will be faithful to us. Action step. Action step. Actually, you know, uh, let's, let's not go there yet. There's something else that Amos says. I forgot verse eight. Oh, verse eight. How could Craig forget verse eight? Verse eight. Let's, let's, let's package this. The lion, what? Has roared. New hope. Here's this theme. Chapter one, verse two. The lion roars from Zion. Back up here. Chapter three, look at one of the questions he asks. Chapter three, verse four. Does a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? The answer in the culture is no. A lion will roar when he has prey. Now take a look at verse eight again. The lion has roared. Who will not fear? It's almost as if Amos is saying, guys, the lion has roared and you are his prey. And as a result of that, he says, who's going to listen? Who's going who's to pay attention? Who, who, will, who will pay attention to this proclamation? And then he says, the Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? I believe what Amos is saying there is this, uh, that as a minister of God proclaiming the word of God to the people of God about the judgment of God, I can't help but prophesy. I can't help but tell you because God's word has compelled me by his Holy Spirit to tell you what's happening. I'm compelled, I'm moved to do this. Whether you listen or not is up to you. But the Lord God has spoken, who can but tell you? Isn't Amos a faithful proclaimer of the word? Trouble is brewing. Now we can move to the action step. Here we go. Pay attention. Uh, pay attention. 
We are not those who bury our heads in the sand. Rather, the signs are obvious, the messages are unified, America is in trouble. Who will listen? Who will revere the Lord? Who will pay attention? The signs are obvious. I'm going to continue to come back to them time and time again because this is what was birthed within my heart this summer. As I look at the signs across our land, the signs are obvious. We have, here it is, if you missed it from the previous two weeks, we have what I believe to be. You ever have one of those moments where the thought's just gone? (laughs) It's just us, right? Oh, here it is. It came back. We have a confused culture on the collapse. We have a corrupt state on the attack. We have a complacent church that is on the sidelines. And it is those three top concerns that I have that as I look across the nation coast to coast, that shows me the signs are obvious of both the passive judgment and active judgment of God going on. What do I mean by that? The passive judgment where the Lord has in fact removed his hand of blessing and protection to let us experience life as we want it, that is life without him. And now active judgment where the Lord will indeed come. Trouble is brewing within our nation because national sin has a a cause effect relationship with divine judgment. So the signs are obvious. Now, if the signs are obvious and if the Lord does in fact do nothing without revealing himself through faithful men who proclaim his word, then it should be evident that there's a unified message going on in culture of faithful churches who indeed are proclaiming this, right? It should be a unified like, okay, is this just Craig or is this a cro- Are we seeing faithful people like Amos who are proclaiming the warning, sounding the alarm, and just to name a few, it is. We are seeing a unified message. Here it is. Billy Graham, before he died, prepare for persecution. David Jeremiah, the church is coming under attack. Erwin Lutzer, we are in a firestorm for the future of America. Eric Metaxas, the whole book, letter to the American church. Russell Moore, Christianity is in crisis. On and on, there's a unified message of, guys, wake up. Guys, you gotta wake up. Trouble is brewing. And there's this unified message in which we have to recognize we got to prepare in advance for what's to come while knowing that there, of course, is hope for the church of Jesus Christ and for everyone who calls upon his name. Trouble is brewing, and it's time to wake up. Let's go to verse 9 and 10. It's time to wake up. God gives Amos a message And it goes like this, proclaim, assemble, and see. Proclaim it, assemble, and see. Say it with me. Proclaim it, assemble, and see. The Lord gives a message to Amos, and Amos now sounds the alarm to the people. He sounds the alarm. He's, he, he, he's saying, guys, it's, it's, it's time to wake up. Now, I understand that about a week and a half ago that one of our U.S. senators pulled the fire alarm in the Capitol building when there was no fire. And some of you probably paid attention to that. We're not going to get into the politics of that. However, understand that when Amos is pulling the fire alarm in Israel, there is a fire. This is not a false alarm. He's pulling a fire because the flames, as it were, are literally leaping at the feet of the people of Israel. And he's sounding the alarm. New Hope, if your home is burning down at midnight, that is not a time to sit in the front yard and sit in a chair, relax and watch and rejoice that you have insurance. It's a time to get in and wake everybody up and rescue people before the flames consume them. And that's what Amos does. He's sounding the alarm. He's saying, guys, you better pay attention. Proclaim it assemble and see what's going on in the culture. Take a look at verse nine. The Lord says, proclaim, declare it to the strongholds in Ashdod and the strongholds of Egypt, huh? It's one of those times you're like, what is that? Ashdod, well, New Hope, listen, it, it doesn't mean a lot to us but that's in the Gaza Strip today. They're still at war with Israel today. They were an ancient enemy then. Egypt was too. And so for some reason, the Lord says, 
Go to Ashdod, go to Egypt and proclaim it. Why? I don't know entirely, do hope. The best I can come up with is that the gravity, the weight of the situation in Israel is so intense that the Lord wants the nations to be witness to what he's going to do to his people. I believe that the Lord is saying, go to Ashad, go to Egypt, and express, declare to them what I'm about to do to my people so that the world may give witness to how serious I am about sin within my people. That's a weighty message. Proclaim it. And then he says, notice, assemble. Say, assemble yourselves. Gather together, everybody, at a location. Where? What does your Bible say? On the mountains of Samaria. Why there? Well, I think two reasons. First of all, the mountains of Samaria are the precise location in which the Lord gathered all of Israel when they first came into the land. He gathered all of Israel together to proclaim a covenant over them. They gathered on the mountains, Gerizim and uh, uh, whatever the other one was, it's gone too. Uh, Two mountains, and and he gathers them together to proclaim this covenant. Say, what covenant, Craig? I'm glad you care. (laughs) The covenant was blessings if you obey, curses if you don't. And so it's almost as if the Lord is saying, okay, get everybody together on the exact location in which I told you this would happen. I think that's significant. The second reason I think it's just more practical, the mountains of Samaria are the, the, the peaks in which, from which they can overlook the land to actually see what's going on. It would be like me telling you, guys, why don't you all assemble on the peaks of the Rocky Mountains and from the highest peaks of the mountains, I want you to look coast to coast, east to west, north to south, and I want you to see what's going on in the culture. And what Amos wants them to see is the, the, the deep deep sin that's going on from the vantage point of the mountains from which the Lord said, blessings if you obey, curses if you don't. What does the Lord see and what does he want the people to see? Well, verse nine and 10, this is exactly what he wants them to see. Here it is. Verse nine and 10 says this. He wants to see public commotion. Look at the public commotion. Look at verse nine. He says, look at the great unrest, the great turmoil. My friends, if you stood on the peaks of the Rockies and looked out from coast to coast, would you not see great turmoil, unrest? And then he says, I want you to see the political oppression. Verse 10, those who have political power are oppressing the innocent. And would we also not see great political oppression going on, that those in power are oppressing those who have none? And then wouldn't we see personal corruption? Look at verse 10 again. And this is from God's perspective. This is, this is as, as candid as God can be. He says, they don't even know how to do right. They don't know how to do right. Stand on the mountain peaks, guys. See what God sees. Proclaim it to the nations. Assemble yourselves. And you're going to see that the whole nation is full of unrest and corruption and the people don't even know how to do right. That's God's perspective. And from that vantage point, he wants to remind them from Joshua 8 and Deuteronomy 11, this is what I told you would happen. And if you disobey, cursings will come. New Hope, does that make sense? Trouble is brewing and it's time to wake up and see what's happening. Action step. Here we go. Action step would be this. Engage in the struggle. Live out your faith in every sphere of life, no matter the tension. This is why we're doing the conference. This is why we're in Amos. Because the calling of the church is to indeed sound the alarm, to prepare the church, to wake us up. Yes, with a smile and joyful endurance because we have hope in a risen Savior and the church is victorious, but it's also a candid realism that the nation is headed for trouble and we are to be those who are prepared in advance to live with joyful endurance and to engage in the struggle. We're not going to be those who conform to the culture. We're not going to be those who are complacent in the culture. Rather, we want to be those who with courage and discretion and conviction and patience and grace and all of the rest that we engage in the struggle. 
Should we be surprised in the midst of great darkness that there's such relational tension? Should we be surprised that there's such unrest and distress within homes? Should we be surprised that there's relational uh, tensions that are separating fathers and mothers and, and, and children and grandparents? Should we be surprised? No, we shouldn't be surprised because Jesus warned about this, I think, in Luke chapter 12, in which he said that there will be mother against daughter and brother against sister and this against that. This is what Christ warned us about, but he is victorious. And so we don't have a posture towards the future of dread. We have a posture that is real. Yes, trouble is brewing and it's time to wake up. But God in his grace and his mercy has proclaimed this to prepare his people. And so we step in with a posture of thankfulness for who God is and for what God has done that he's given us his word and the indwelling Holy Spirit in the church of Jesus Christ that we navigate together forward. Trouble is brewing. It's time to wake up and look on the horizon. Look on the horizon. God tells Amos what's coming. Amos tells the people what's coming. It's not pretty. In fact, it's ugly. We're gonna proclaim the word and then we're gonna simply say, is this true of us? When Amos looks ahead at the culture, he is uh, compelled by the Spirit to warn them, and what he's warning them is three things are on the horizon. And the first one is, the nation's going to get shaken, guys. Look at verse 11. Being written and proclaimed in about 750 B.C., which is important, keep that in mind. Verse 11, he says, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, An adversary shall surround the land and bring down your defenses from you and your strongholds shall be plundered. I believe the translation there is the nation's gonna get shaken, guys. As for the adversary, who is that? We know from history, Assyria. Here's the important part. That happened about 25 years later. The word of God in time would prove true. Israel would be surrounded, Israel would be brought down, Israel would be exiled never to return. Judgment had come upon the nation. The nation would be shaken. And Amos is there ahead of time, birthed with the Holy Spirit conviction to say, guys, it's happening, and you better wake up before it happens. And fix your eyes upon the living God of the universe. Wake up, prepare to meet God, seek the Lord and live. This is his message. The lion has roared from Zion and the nation will be shaken. It is not incumbent upon any pastor, let alone me, to date or forecast or say this is when it's gonna happen. But I'm telling you, birth of the Holy Spirit, there are the warning signs to say the signs are clear, so you better pay attention before it happens. The nation will be shaken. The second thing that he's saying is that the remnant will be small. Uh, What is remnant language? What does that mean? It simply means uh, fragments of the faithful. Uh, Those who are faithful to the Lord will be very few. Take a look at the imagery in verse 12. Such profound imagery when he says this. Thus says the Lord, as the shepherd rescues From the mouth of the, what? There's that lion again. As the shepherd, the loving shepherd, rescues from the mouth of the lion. Does he get the whole lamb? No, he doesn't. Look at it. As he rescues from the mouth of the lion, two legs or a piece of an ear, little fragments of a lamb, so shall the people of Israel who dwell in Samaria be rescued. What's the point? The point is that the remnant of God's people will be very, very small. That those who are faithful to the living God will be very small. But God, who indeed is the loving shepherd, will be faithful to preserve a remnant for his glory. This tells us something that is laced with hope, by the way. Let's go to the key thought, Greg, for verse 12. The key thought for verse 12, the next one is this, is no matter how dark the times or how few the faithful, the shepherd will save his own. 
This is great hope. Yeah, trouble is brewing, but don't misunderstand that we have a loving shepherd who has promised all that the Father has given to me will come to me, and all who come to me I will never cast out, and not one of them will be snatched from my hand. The true and better shepherd who does indeed rescue will save, but make no mistake, church, the remnant will be small. Should that surprise us? No, this is what Jesus warned. This is what Apostle Paul talks about, that as times grow increasingly dark, that the remnant will grow increasingly small, yet God is faithful. The nation will be shaken, the remnant will be small, and the third, judgment will be swift. Take a look at verse 13 through 15, and you'll see a series of the Lord's divine judgment. He says, I will punish this, and I will punish that, and I will punish Israel for transgressions, and I will strike Notice verse 15, what he's going to strike. He's going to strike your Torch Lake home and your South Florida home. Oh, no. Look at it. Look at it. Look at it. It's, okay, it doesn't say Torch or Florida, but he says, I will strike the winter house along with the summer house and the houses of ivory shall perish and all the great houses shall come to an end. All the big ones, great ones, gone. Why? Well, because of verse 14. I will punish Israel for her transgressions. National sin has a cause and effect relationship with divine judgment. That's what's going on. Now, let me draw attention to one piece of imagery, which normally we'd just kind of gloss over. It's one of those verses like in devotions, you kind of like read, you're like, oh, that doesn't make sense. I'll just move on. (laughs) Right? We've all done it. Verse 14, I will punish the altars of Bethel, that's the house of God, the place where they gather for, at that time for false worship. It should have been true worship, but, and here it is. And the horns of the altar, just stop there for a moment. Horns of the altar, huh? Here's what you need to know. In that time, if you had any problem, any distress, any relational issue, somebody's coming after you to kill you, you had, you had issues going on which was, which was threatening your life, there was one place in Israel that you could go to. This is established in the Old Testament. One place you could go to for safety, like those games as kids that used to play where tag or whatever else, and they have like safe zones, that as long as you're in the safe zone, you're safe, nobody can touch you. Well, that's the horns of the altar. If you go to the horns of the altar and you cling to them, it's like, I'm safe. Nobody can get me. It's my refuge. Now look at verse 14. (laughs) What is the Lord going to do to the horns of the altar? Going to cut them off. What the Lord is saying is that there will be no safe place. The economic collapse will be so significant that you can't go to your Torch Lake home, the summer home. You can't go to the winter home. You can't go here. You can't go. You can't rest in wealth. You can't rest in the economy. You can't rest in policy. The Lord is saying that the divine judgment will be so swift It will be so significant, there will be no place to hide. Oh, except in the saving hand of the God of the universe who has promised to save a remnant for his glory. Action step. Action step is prepare your house. The most important house you own is not your summer home or your winter home, but your eternal home that you have through Jesus Christ. It is Jesus who said this, He gave the great invitation that he is going to go and prepare a place for us. And if he goes to prepare a place for us, he will come again to take you to myself that where I am, you may also be. The most important home you have is not your summer home. It's not your winter home. It is your eternal home. In fact, the most important home you have is established on the foundation of Jesus Christ through which you proclaim him to your children, your grandchildren, and that you're raising up a house, a generation of people who are faithful. Small and few, but faithful. And in the midst of a culture that is increasingly dark, I would be here today to tell you that trouble is brewing, yes, and it's time to wake up and look on the horizon of where we're headed. But that is a message that I'm lacing together with hope. And the reason I'm lacing it with hope is because I was on a bike ride this week with my friend from New Hope, and uh, I told him I was gonna share this. And he said to me this, I taught Amos in Sunday school years ago. I struggled to find any hope in it. And we had a good laugh about that. 
I said, yeah, that's true. Amos is a tough message. But in the midst of Amos, I find hope. Why? Because God is gracious enough to warn the culture of trouble before it happens. He's gracious enough to reveal his secret and his plan through faithful people who will proclaim it to the people. Why? Because the Lord wants his people to be ready, to be prepared in advance. And he wants his people to know that there is a safe place of refuge, the horns of the altar through Jesus Christ. The one who can save you from the law of sin and death personally and the one through whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And you can run to him and cling to him. And it is that relationship that the Lord longs to have with his people. Yes, the nation may have troubling times ahead, but the church will rise victorious through that relationship, through that connection that we have through Jesus Christ who died for us and rose again that we may live with him forever in that eternal home. That's the most important home we have. And so as we navigate the challenges of this culture, my friends, we do so, again, with hope and with perspective, knowing that his plan, God's plan, is unfolding in history, and nobody can stop him. That's the message of Amos. And I pray today that he who has ears to hear, that you would hear what the Spirit says to the church. Let's recap for 60 seconds. Worship team, come on up. Recap is this. Here it is. A sermon in a sentence. Wake up and realize the nation is headed for trouble and yet there is hope. There is hope. Action steps would be these. Action steps, pay attention. Pay attention to what's going on. Listen up, hear this word. Engage in the struggle that every sphere of life that we would radiate the hope of the gospel. Remember that graph. We are not those who conform to the culture. We are not those who are complacent in the culture. We are those who have courage and conviction in the midst of the culture. And finally, prepare your house. The most important home you own is not your summer home, not your winter home. The eternal home you have through a relationship with Christ as Lord. Would you bow your heads? Renew your affections once again, placing faith and trust in him, giving him thanks that he will save a remnant for his glory. Well, to all of you friends and family in the online community, thank you for joining with us today on October 8th uh, here at New Hope as we've turned and looked at the book of Amos. We've seen that trouble is brewing. It's time to wake up and look on the horizon. My friend, as we continue to go through the book of Amos, I just want to tell you as your pastor, I love you guys. My calling is to equip the church and prepare you for the coming days ahead. And I believe that Amos has a profound message, not just for his time, 750 years before Jesus, but also a message th throughout the ages, a call for the people of God to wake up, pay attention to what's going on, and prepare for days ahead. We can do so with resilience, and don't forget, we can do so with great joy and confidence, knowing that God's plan is unfolding in history. He is building his church, and nothing can stop him. I look forward to being back with you next Sunday as we turn again to the book of Amos. Until then, I'm your pastor, Craig Trueweiler, reminding you that you are loved.